Catherine Graham from the Washington Post uh, has a fabulous uh, saying that I always have as a byline on my email. To love what you do and feel that it matters, how could anything be more fun? So I just really invite people to really look at this age and stage as a new chapter, maybe an encore career, maybe an, an opportunity just to find something new in your life. We are looking forward our way from Studio C in the 511 Studios. That's in the Brewery District, just south of downtown Columbus, Ohio. Hi, this is Brett. Over the years, Carol and I have had many conversations regarding issues affecting job seekers, that being limits on job opportunities, preconceptions built into applicant tracking systems, and difficulty using social media as the basis for a job search. However, the greatest issue has been ageism in the hiring process. Today, we have the opportunity to hear about a program to support the 50-plus job seeker throughout the state of Massachusetts. We hope the information on the program is going to help provide a new program model for here in Central Ohio. You know, Brett, today's guest has a whole different slant on how to reach and support the 50-plus job seeker population. So we are welcoming Deborah Hope, an executive career coach, certified master coach, and the founder of Leader and facilitator of the Massachusetts Library Collaborative 50 Plus Job Seekers Networking Group. I make a lot of mistakes because it's such a long title. Um, Deborah is uh, successfully supporting 50 Plus Job Seekers on the East Coast. So, Deborah, thank you so much for joining us from Boston. Thank you very much, Brett and Carol. I am honored and thrilled to be here. And I'm so happy to make this connection through my daughter, Rebecca, who's with the Chamber of Commerce of Columbus, Ohio. Yes, we have to give a shout out to Becca. It was great. (laughs) Well, before we explain to our listeners how your program began, uh, could you first talk about you, your career field in finance, including a little stint on Wall Street, and um, an overview of your background, how you eventually moved into this career coaching arena? Great question, Brett. And I loved it because... Further on in the podcast, you're going to ask me some tips about how to tell your career story briefly. (laughs) (laughs) You opened up with a great question. I uh, had an undergraduate degree in sociology. I've always been fascinated with why people do what they do or how they think. And I would have majored in psychology if we had that major at my college. (laughs) Um, So sociology was my undergraduate. I was a social worker for a little bit. When I um, got my MBA, I followed uh, in the footsteps. Uh, I, I, I did some business work, and so I decided that an MBA would be more fun to do than um, another degree. So I did my MBA at uh, Boston College and f- followed my parents, my mom, in the investment industry and my older brother. And my mother was a trailblazer in the Boston investment industry uh, meaning breaking glass ceilings. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, first, first woman to be uh, admitted to the Boston Securities Traders Association. And I'm bragging about that because that was in the 50s. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's one. What a, what a great role model you had in the start right. of your career. Not many people have that. Correct, correct. And she just loved the business of the investment business. Um, she was on the institutional side as my brother was. So that's where I went. Um, as opposed to retail and uh, at dinner table conversation was always about how the stock market did today and Mm -hmm. (laughs) the million share trades, that type of thing. So it was a lot of fun. So I did, I I was on Wall Street for 20 years, uh, working always in the Boston office of a major broker, a major investment bank, including Barclays, Credit Lyonnais, Payne Weber, (laughs) Drexel Burnham, lots of fun places. And then um, 9-11 happened and I, my trading desk, I was managing, a managing director of a trading desk and I um, um, had an open mic to my New York office and the, there was a lot of chaos and, and pain and screaming and they were not at the World Trade Center but across the street from the World Trade Center. So it was a really pivotal time and we also, I was on the 38th floor overlooking um, floor to ceiling windows overlooking Logan Airport in Boston Harbor. 
So it was pretty frightening because Boston, if you recall, had an airplane that um, that was trashed, um, crashing. Um, so we were all pretty shaken by it all. And within two years, I left that business because I was thinking, I have two toddlers at home. My parents are elderly and the fire truck cannot reach me on the 38th floor. So I decided to get a ground level job and I um, stayed at home for a while. So I did that. And then in 2010, I started, I immersed myself in coaching. As I took a self-assessment, a, a, a huge self-assessment, what did I really love about my 20 year career, 25 year career in finance? I loved the clients that I had. I loved the relationships. I loved fostering my employees uh, to support them in moving forward. I just loved that part of the coaching, so to speak. And so I immersed myself in a, a wonderful International Coach Federation program, two-year program, and started a practice in 2010. And then during the pandemic, I did another two-year program for a master's level coaching program out of the Whole Point Institute. When you did your assessment, was that through an organization through a nonprofit, or did you go straight to the assessment company? Assessments can come in so many forms. That is one of the um, modules of the program that I run now. Um, I did in the integral coaching program I did through New Ventures West, again, which is uh, professionally certified through the International Coach Federation. It, there is a deep assessment there. Through the program. So it was it was more of a deep personal dive in doing mm -hmm. my own inner work. We have this gremlin that's playing around in our heads a lot. Oh, you can't do that. Or right. you shouldn't do that. Or why are you doing that? <laughs> so that was I was working with my gremlin and what I cannot do and versus what I really would love to do. So I, I did that kind of assessment. And I did some skills assessments more with friends who had this, the, the, yeah, it was more of colleagues who had some tools that they helped me use and that type of thing. So no, I did not go directly to a company, but well, I do recommend some companies now that I've become certified in other programs. Right. Well, and the reason I'm asking, it's really a, a great segue right into my first question. Um, this is what people come to us and talk about. I want to make a change. I want to transition. I don't want to completely retire, but I don't know what to do. So the the notion of really sitting back and however you do that assessment, if you do it personally, just yourself thinking through it, or you take an actual um, mechanical test, you you go through those steps of not just what I can do, but what do I want to do. So Correct. great. Okay. So now my next question is, let's talk about the 50 plus job seekers networking group. This group began, I think, in the 2020, just before the pandemic. And let's discuss why you created the program, who your target audience is, methods that you've utilized to outreach to people. And um, how to, exactly did you create that format? Because it's an all online program. It started the program, the curriculum, that format was created in 2016 uh, by a career coach, Susan Kelly. That's it right there. But um, by Susan Kelly, a career coach, she in her 40 year career, um, career as a career coach noticed that people over 50 could benefit from polishing and fine tuning and retuning their job search tools. So she originally reached out to the Massachusetts Council on Aging the executive office of elder affairs out of the governor's office and they funded the program and it was to be distributed through um meaning uh, presented through the local councils on aging which in massachusetts is in every town and we had 17 locations just before the pandemic we grew from in 2016 when she started 2015 when she started it um to 17 locations throughout the state and every year was always a question of where do we get, will the funding come through again from the state? How's the state doing? And, and will the funding come through? And we always had a gap 
from the fiscal year end of June 30 to September. We never knew if we were going to get funded and if we were going to be up and running. So several of us reached out to other venues for funding and other ways to create this program and other venues with funding. And that's when I reached out to the Tewksbury Library. Robert Hayes is the community outreach librarian and head of technical services. And Robert Hayes has been hugely on board with this as a co-facilitator of every program we've done together since 2019. So we started first um, with an on-site there in 2019 at the Tewksbury Library. And then from there, we have reached out to more libraries. And today, 62 public libraries throughout Massachusetts in Southern New Hampshire have supported this program. So they fund the program. It, the program itself is not a 501c3, is it? Um, a licensed nonprofit? So it's no, just a standalone it's program. Phenomenal. Correct. That's phenomenal. Wow. So you had this established before the the pandemic, but of course everything changed um, for everybody. How are you able to stay connected to the clients and, and did actually did the program itself change or maybe just the technology or the format? So pandemic comes, we are in 17 locations throughout the state through the Mass Council on Aging. With Robert Hayes, the Tewksbury Library, I had an on-site meeting as um, there and we'd have about 25, 30 people at every meeting. And yes, then we go to Zoom and all of a sudden there's no geographic boundary. So everyone can be on the computer and we had people from all over the state, um, mostly the, the the surrounding area of Tewksbury and the Merrimack Valley here uh, north of Boston. and. Then it grew, it grew and grew. More libraries heard about it. More libraries wanted to be involved. And again, because it was on Zoom, more libraries could participate mm -hmm. and more people could participate. So so the the audience grew the um, and the technology grew as well, right? Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Brett? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I guess because I was looking at it, I know everything, like I just said, everything changed during the pandemic. It just comes down to, how it changed. I was curious about if the numbers actually were up or down uh, for attendees because of whether there was actually a lack of jobs or those that wanted to work during the pandemic. How did that affect that, too? Right. That's a really good question. Since 2019, people have come into this program, and this is one part of their networking, right? This program is one part of their networking. I, I encourage people to go to to other venues to learn how to do PowerPoint, to learn their tools and to network professional associations, alumni associations, network as much as possible. So people have touched this program and since 2019, 111 people have landed jobs. Wow. So that's, that's a run rate be, um, up until 2022. That run rate was about one every two weeks. In 2023, here we are in our third month, um, we're in 2023 alone, we're running about one every 10 days. So people are finding more jobs this year than in the past. That's very positive. That's it is very, very positive. It's very exciting. And I invite anybody who's found a job to come back and share pearls of wisdom, what mm -hmm. worked for them when they when they were doing their job search, which which job search tool was the best for them? What did they think was a great idea? give some pearls of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Have you included that in the program, bringing back alum, <laughs> let's put it that way, to talk? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Every week we have we usually yeah. have somebody. This past Wednesday, I do it every Wednesday. Um, on the first and third Wednesdays, we do it in the morning for two hours. And then on the um, second and fourth Wednesdays, we have a, an evening program that we just instituted in 2023. Yes, we bring back this past Wednesday, as I said, we congratulated five five people who who landed jobs in the past two to three weeks. Wow, that's phenomenal. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Did, and uh, the jobs, the jobs range from um, the uh, see, David just uh, became the senior chemical process engineer at an inter multinational company. And then another person decided to go back to law school. 
um, <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, well, it ranges. It really ranges. Another man was a boat builder for his career, but realized physically he couldn't build the boats anymore. Now he he wants to be the facilities manager at Town Hall, and he got the job. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Do you tend to see folks working uh, more part-time or full-time positions? It it really varies. It really varies. It's um, I'd say for the most part it's full time, mm-hmm. but it it varies. It's probably a sixty forty. So Debbie, it sounds like this program has grown tremendously since the pandemic. Um, it it's all electronic online now, but you have many more people over a larger geographic area. Um, how in the world are you keeping track of all these folks and? Um, How do you keep them on the right path? The program has grown tremendously, primarily because of the distribution and the word getting out through so many libraries, 62 libraries, 62 newsletters, uh, 62 buzz buzz feeds, right? So that's that's, uh, a big part of it and the popularity of it. I'm a partner with uh, Massachusetts Hire. It's Mass Hire is used to be the what we used to call the unemployment office, but here in Massachusetts, we um, we partner with. Uh, sorry, the Mass Hire is the name of the unemployment office now, so that they go out and get partnerships with corporations to help people get jobs. So they also um, present the program. A lot of people know it now because it's been around since 2015. So a lot more people know about the program. That's partly how it's grown. Again, with no geographic boundaries, anybody can join. I probably have about um, 50 people from out of state um, on our master list um, for both, both programs. We have about 500, 600 people that we mail out this notice to every, every week. Um, Keeping track of them. So the program is meant to be self-generative, meaning, and and that's the type of coaching I do as well as an integral coach. How do we foster independence and how do we foster you to take your own initiative to attend the self-assessment, to do them, to, um, to write your resume in a different format, to get through the applicant tracking system, to create a LinkedIn profile, to learn how to use Zoom. How do you, so it's self-generative. I, I'm, I'm not, the, the program's not meant to be um, tracking individuals. It's meant to be supportive and people reach out and I, I answer emails, but it's meant to be self-generative. I think you also mentioned to us that you give them some cues and tips on how to work together. Oh, absolutely, right, absolutely. I, that's part of what I encourage everyone to find and create job search buddies so that there's a, a, an accountability group, a small accountability group. Maybe during the sessions, we do have breakout rooms where people can network in smaller groups than the usual 70 to 8,500 people that come to the meetings. So we usually have a Zoom room full of about 70 to 100 any time, any week. And so we have breakout rooms where we practice an exercise on one of the tools we're working on. And I say, when you go into those groups, chat and see if anybody is up for meeting on a weekly basis, maybe to just accountability, just a, like a, a study group maybe we had in college. Mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. Right. I wanted to go back to your, your comment about the, that territory. You know, you were just Boston for a bit. Now it's basically the whole state, even outside. What changes have you seen in the clients coming to for the assistance? Are, are they changing the career fields? You see mostly maybe it was a change from blue collar to white collar. I mean, education level, even the age range. Um, did it become a little bit older, a little bit younger? What was the sense of the changes over that time period? We, like I said, we were in 17 locations in 2021. There was a survey done and the the typical, if you can say, and again, the, the audience changes. It's mostly professional people, about 60% who answered the survey you we were talking earlier who answers the survey right but 60 mm. percent of the people had prof- uh, college degrees and 40 percent we were surprised 40 percent had terminal degrees meaning beyond masters so um highly educated mostly professional people who had a 20 year plus successful career 
Yeah, that that's know. that's interesting that you saw that that high of an education. I, I, I and and that speaks to that people just weren't expecting to have to go look for a job. <laughs> they they it's they've so chose true. a they chose a career that you thought that I'm going to begin here and I'll end here or doing the same thing somewhere else like a professor. That they may change a university once or twice possibly, but you expect to finish your career as a professor. So true. So true. And so many people thought, gee, I'm so skilled in this industry. Mm -hmm. And for many people like myself, I just turned my company was acquired. So I turned and the next opportunity was there Mm -hmm. or or Joe uh, or Mary, my boss would move to another company and I'd follow that person anywhere. Right. Mm So um, it was it was easy. Right. And then all of a sudden, life has changed dramatically in a lot of respects in the in the workforce and people are laid off and the the average age of this group is 55 to 65 and we're baby boomers Mm -hmm. and i always say we're not done yet we changed the world back in the 60s (laughs) and we're still trying to change it and we really want to make a meaningful impact we want to be relevant we want to work we want to work and um, a lot of people at this age and stage move from ambition to mission and I invite people to really take a pause. This is a great gift. Take a pause and really think about what you want to do next. It doesn't have to be what you did for the last 20, 25 years. It doesn't have to be totally the same skill set that you used before. It could be something that you were dreaming about trying when you were swinging on a swing or out in the ball field. Um, or riding your bike, what do you really want to do? And somebody piped up and said, an astronaut? And I said, maybe, who knows? Look who's going into space, right? 90-year-olds going into space. So Mm -hmm. who knows? But the world is really different now. It really is. And your age really is your edge. You bring wisdom. You want to work. You bring passion. If you find it, find your passion. It's really important to find your passion. And just go for it. Go for it. And what's odd is, I think, for that generation that's foreign to them to be able to act on a dream. That's not the way they grew up. If you think about it, they kind of went, you know, they kind of followed what they did with their parents. Their parents worked, so they went to work. Oh, you mean the GE plant kind of thing? Yeah, okay. a yeah. little bit, a little yeah. bit. I mean, I, yeah. I think because the boomer generation is so large, I think. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. younger ones now, you know, uh, th- th- that that cross between Generation X and Boomer, possibly we're seeing the last of that mindset that I think, mm-hmm. gen, you know, we, but we grew up, or, I mean, I'm, uh, myself included, my mom and dad, they, uh, you know, they weren't entrepreneurs, but I am. How did I become an entrepreneur? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Other than I'm just part of a different generation that embraces it. Right. So I think you, you right. kind of, so I, I could see where it would be difficult to sit there. And, and I guess I'm, to my point being, I could see the client's kind of going, you mean I'm allowed to dream? You mean I'm allowed to be able to, you know, I could see that being, you have to let that settle. And You do have to let that settle. And realize, right? yeah, you can. What do you right. want to do? You know? Right. And Wait. it's not too late. It's not right. too late. And you, right. And your age is your is your edge. Think mm-hmm. about Ray Kroc, who started McDonald's over when he was over 50. Uh, 60%, I think, of Warren Buffett's wealth was created over 60 <laughs> granted, right. we're, I granted he's a lot of has a lot of wealth, but um, right. Yeah. Um, well, uh, and it, when you think about us growing up in the baby boomer generation, we didn't have as much distraction as younger folks did. Sure. Even Brett's generation had a lot more distraction, a lot of other opportunities, a lot of other things to do. You know, we sort of played sports, but these guys played sports in school. Uh, uh, that those were the, uh, like you said, the mm-hmm. emphasis for us was the expectation to go to work. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm a I'm a daughter of parents who experienced the depression, the mm-hmm. deep depression mm-hmm. in this country. Sure. And so work was really the number one thing. If you can get work, that's great. My father was an entrepreneur. Like I said, my mom was a trailblazer in the investment business, but it was always work. It was always make sure you you get a job. And I've been working since I was 10, right? When I got my babysitter certificate and 
flew, rode my, uh, passed my flyers out around the neighborhood on my bike, right? I could babysit. <laughs> Boy, that brings back a memory. <laughs> I know, right? It I does. Know. So, it does. Right, right. So really exciting. It's a really exciting time. Take stock and remember now, you probably tuition, you're finished with tuition payments. Maybe your mortgage is really low or none of, none at all. Um, your parents, maybe they're still with you. Maybe they're not. But uh, the, the obligations of, of being a, a parent with toddlers and navigating college and high school and all those things is, is past now. So mm-hmm. um, really, it's your time. It's it's your time now. So really think about what you might want to do. Right. That that uh, the I, I I hear a lot of wonderful stories from job seekers after 111 people have landed jobs, but the woman who went back to law school was so exciting. I was thrilled. She was too, and she got she decided to do it because when she was taking care of her aging parents, she got into a lot of understanding about the legal end of aging parents and the the facilities she had to be involved with and and just understanding all the legalities of being an aging parent. Right. So she decided she could be an advocate in a, in a good way. When the dean of the law school found out she was applying, he called her right away. He was thrilled to have a 60-something in his class. That's wonderful. That's And great. offered her some tuition. Right. Good. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Wait. Well, elder law is one of the topics we talk about, and there are a lot of issues to to that people need to take care of Mm -hmm. if they are older or if they have older family or friends that Mm -hmm. just need that help so more Mm -hmm. power to her that's wonderful right well let's talk about the programs more specifically it's a 12-week program and um, as we mentioned it's all online what i love about all of the topics that you have You put a lot of stress on understanding your career story, which is how we sort of started this podcast. It's critical because folks don't really understand the skills they bring to an employer. They don't see the value they bring to the employer because they don't see their career story, number one, is very interesting. And they also don't really uh, grab hold of how they are strong and experienced and have wonderful skills so if a job seeker can't get a handle on that and what their accomplishments are, they really can't make that case to an employer when they're applying for a job. So let's talk a little bit about tips that you give your clients in understanding and how to convey their own career story. Right. How do you fit decades into a, a few sentences? Yes, exactly. <laughs> how, do you, how do you also present yourself to somebody my daughter's age, my daughter is 27, <clears throat> how do you present yourself? Because oftentimes you're being interviewed by somebody who is in their 20s, right, or 30s, and um, and, and how do you present what IBM used to look like, right? <laughs> or, um, or what GE once was, right, a huge conglomerate and blah, right, right. So um, it's, it's, it's difficult and you have to practice what we recommend is that you focus forward, focus forward, um, create brevity, um, talk with your passion, with energy. And one of the um, one of the key things is uh, there's many ways that you can visualize it. But picture that you are driving a bus, and you have a, you're the and you're driving your own bus of life, and you you've got a huge windshield in front of you. So you're focusing your career story on what you want to do and what you can do to solve their pain whatever the job description is Mm -hmm. you can solve that pain because of maybe um two or three projects that you worked on or uh, five achievements that you why you were awarded the top uh, sales award in the nation for building so many clients or the um, as a project manager, you were able to bring the project in under budget and on time, or maybe you uh, invented something. Maybe you worked in a clean lab and you were able to create or get the, the clinical product to market because you brought all these different um, people together. But but brevity, focus, and what you want to do more of. Again, it's not an autobiography. Your career story is about 
the skills that you can apply to the job that you are applying for. Right. Exactly. How to ease their pain. So you're talking about the the verbal piece of it right there. Let's let's talk about the physical, like the the resumes and the cover letters. Um, it's successful that for that next job and, and, and the hunt, what tips do you have for job seekers as they are creating these documents? So, for example, um, something that's new now is the applicant tracking system. There are many versions of an applicant tracking system. So if you're applying for a job online, there, your resume for the statistics, the latest statistics show that there are about 250 to 300 applications for every one job and how could any human look at that many and they don't so they have this this software it's artificial intelligence that will scan your application for keywords from the job description of what they're looking for so step one is to look at the job description highlight keywords and in your resume is not a one and done when i was growing up you would get your resume typeset on linen paper <laughs> and you <laughs> and you would edit it and you would uh it was one resume chronological this is what i did now today the resume is more of an active document so for your job description you create a resume that's more tailored to focus on the job description so that is one um one aspect of it use action words and um I use a format, I recommend, highly recommend a format, stars, so that you have a pocket full of stars, a situation, a task, an action, and a result. Rather than describing what your job um, entailed, and rather than um, creating a job description, create what your achievements were in your experience. Raised revenues by 65% because I took over a new division. Um, uh, national sales award five years in a row for uh, increasing business by 20%, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, put the action, quantify it as much as you can, a situation, task, action, result. And those stars can be used in interviews. They can be used on your LinkedIn profile. They can be used in telling your career story and they can be used on your resumes. So on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the hardest thing that they have to do, is this process probably a 10? The resume? Yeah. Or The resume. You know, good question. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I've got to get my resume perfect. No, it's really, a, it's really the, whole, the whole package. How can you network as mm -hmm. much as you can? Pushing the button and applying online about 75% of jobs are found through networking. So only 25% of jobs are found not networking, pushing a button and applying online. That's what I'm trying to tell my 23-year-old daughter. <laughs> I know, I know. It affects, know. Every, affects every age. That's the thing. It, it, this is not unique no, to an adult not. over 50. Correct. It is the world. So it, yes, there is, and, and that's not to discount ageism. I'm, I'm, that is not what that means. But we're all fighting the same problems. We are all rowing um, a boat right in the same direction of trying to get a job. <laughs> and ask your 23-year-old daughter if she would rather hire somebody that she knew or that, that her girlfriend knew or her sweetheart knew or her professor knew than not. Right, right. So yeah. that's networking. It's just a conversation, but networking, networking, networking. Mm -hmm. So I invite people to apply for the job online, look on on LinkedIn for who is a connection that you can make and who in your alumni organization or your professors or former bosses know people um, in your social network who might, you never know if the person next door mowing the lawn might be your next connection, you never know. Maybe they know somebody at IBM where is one of the companies you want to work for. Mm -hmm. We, right. Whenever I uh, do a networking workshop for clients here in Columbus, Columbus, uh, people think Columbus is a small city. It's actually the 15th largest city in the country. So there are a lot of people here. Um, wow. But we always, I always mention that poor Kevin Bacon has to go through six degrees of separation 
but in Columbus it's three, and because I'm Italian, it's actually two because we're all related. I'm sure it's the same in Boston. I mean, Boston's a huge metro area, but you all tend to know each other. You you there? It's networking shouldn't be hard. Right. It it really shouldn't be hard because we know so many people getting to the next degree of person from somebody we know to their friend to their friend. It it's um it shouldn't be that difficult. And I wonder if the difficulty in networking isn't so much that we're afraid to talk to people. We don't know what to talk to them about because we haven't done all that internal thinking about what are we looking for in a job. Oftentimes, job seekers are just trying to find a job regardless of what it is, where it is. I need a job. I have bills to pay. Instead of sitting back doing all that internal process of where are my skills, what do I want to do, who needs this, these skills, and so they, they it, it it should you know networking should just kind of roll off the tongue, and it and it, that's hard to do. That's hard to get to that point. Well, that that circles back to the when we first started the podcast that this is one of the new things, so to speak. As I said many times during my career, the next job was there, or you knew people who knew you, and uh, the idea is to get out there and have and be known. Um, the, the Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor says, in order to be successful in the world, you need to be known. So it's no, the Rolodex of the old days was, was who is my network, my Rolodex. But the LinkedIn today is the new modern Rolodex. It is, it's, a, it's a two-way Rolodex, right? right? So who knows you? About 75% of hiring managers and recruiters go to LinkedIn. So they get a resume, they go to LinkedIn. They are looking to fill a job, engineer, electrical engineer, they go to LinkedIn. They are looking for a career coach, <laughs> they go to LinkedIn. So they, LinkedIn is, is a, huge, a huge tool and that is a good beginning for a network. It's a very robust platform. It's a very robust program for free. It's for free. You can right. find out who at a company works is in your network already or who went to your school or who is part of the professional association that right. you're involved with. Right. It's they're really not just they're not just looking at you and your profile. They're looking to see who you know, who's connected to you, where you worked, if there are connections there that they know. And there's a lot of bits and pieces on your network pro or in your LinkedIn profile that you don't even realize are there that the employers are looking at. Correct, correct. And you can find a lot about the company and the people you'll be talking with, interviewing with. Exactly. I, I often invite people to be sure that you look up who they are on LinkedIn and find out a little bit more about what they follow, what their interests are, where they have worked before, prior to this job, Right. Uh, what, what schools they went to. You know, right. when you think about it, and when we went after our first job out of school, we had to go down to the downtown library and the business section and look up all of those old indexes to find out more about a company, even right. the address. Right. Now you right. just punch it into your computer and all that information comes spewing back at you. So our 50 plus job seekers don't know how easy it is compared to going to the downtown <laughs> library to look for that information. So yeah, right. that's great. That's great. So resumes are t tough. Um, Creating LinkedIn profiles can be tough, but I truly think that the hardest part of a job search is an interview. Um, yes, if you know the person because they're part of your network, that's a little easier, but I'm sure you have a bunch of tips to tell your clients on how to be a successful interviewer. Sure. And also just to to be clear, I, I these these job search tools they can be tough, but they can also, it depends on, on the lens that you're looking at them um, through. They, they can also, it's exciting that in the old days when we had to have a typographer do your resume, it was a huge issue when you saw a typo, right? And you mm. had to go back. And, and, and so now it's just a click of a button and you can spew out another one. So I, I think the, the resume process and there's so many online tools and templates and different ways. So I invite people to create a, a plain resume 
for the applicant tracking system. That's black and white, standard categories. Don't put any tables in. But then when you go for the interview in person, or even in addition to applying online, email or not, yeah, you can either email to the directly to a person, or you can mail it or hand deliver it directly to a person, one with graphics on it, with color, one with um, uh, maybe a column on the left side that now shows all your achievements and, and different ways that you can present your resume. So it's a lot of fun too. You can have a lot of fun with it. And, and networking can be a lot of fun. It can be, it really can be. So um, it depends on the lens that you use in going um, with these tools. It is different now. And by joining a group, a networking group um, that, that meets consistently and getting accountability buddies, you can commiserate and support each other with new ideas of what of what was working, how they're getting traction. Mm -hmm. Like some people uh, for their core competencies on their resume, when they changed, they titrated a title, a sales engineer instead of a salesman. Mm -hmm. That got that got him a lot of traction. A lot more people looking at him. Mm -hmm. A sales engineer. He wasn't an engineer by training, but he but he was. Um, he was trained in sales enough to call himself an engineer, so in a different sense, correct? Wonderful, yes, um, yes. And another person was skilled in Sarbanes-Oxley, that, that legislature that we had in the in, in the finance world after um, the 2008 issues we had. So um, he, when he put SOX compliant in big, bold letters at the top of his core competencies, that got him a lot of traction. When people can speak four or five languages and the job requires that, that's fabulous. Put that up there in bold letters. Mm -hmm. So there, uh, that's what I love about resumes. But the next job didn't require five languages or um, proficiency. So you change it. But it's so easy to, to do that. With interviewing, I invite that what we've already talked about, right? I, in, I in The brevity, the career story. Be brief in your interviews with your answers. Have that pocket full of stars that you did with your when you were writing your resume and your LinkedIn profile. Bring your energy. Bring your passion. I had um, an executive, former executive from Corn Ferry, which is one of the high, the largest um, headhunters in the in the world. Um, I had him come and speak to the group, and he, uh, he said, "What would you, what would you recommend to an older job seeker going into a, into a, um, an interview?" And he just looked at me and he said, "Gee, I never thought about it. When I was recruiting, I just wanted the best candidate. I didn't think about the age." He said, "But what I would recommend highly is bringing in your energy. So if that takes doing fifty push-ups before you go into the meeting, <laughs> or..." Um, um, sorry, Amy Cuddy has a book in research, evidence-based research about how you you pose in your um, your posture and how it can change the chemistry in your brain. So be sure you before you go in, relax. There's um, and, and relax before you go into the interview. And if that's a Zoom interview, you do some relaxation techniques beforehand. Or for me, I need to go for a, a long run or um, an extra long swim. Um, I, I need to really get the willies out, so to speak, or just bring some energy and bring your passion. Why are you the best candidate? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and address the elephant in the room. I'm a mature worker and I bring wisdom, crisis management. When the lights go out, I know what to do. Right. I pick up a pencil and I write the ticket to make sure that the stock gets purchased. Right. And, and we want to work. We're not rolling a suitcase in on Thursday and saying, I'm out of here for the weekend. Sorry, I can't be at that meeting tomorrow. We're not doing that. We want to work. Our generation wants to work. So I hope that answered some interview tip questions. <laughs> I, I, it did. And, and it, it indirectly answered one thing that I always tell clients resumes as you said they can be fun there's a lot of work to it but the better that you prepare your resume the better interview you can give because you've done all the research you know what you can do you know what you have done by creating that beautiful resume so that's what you're talking to the interviewer about you've Correct. done the you've done your homework you can be a good interviewer so it, it, it takes kind of it takes the willies out of out of doing the interview because you're right. ready you're ready to go right. you've got your story down 
practice, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And I invite people to practice that career story, those star achievement stories, your resume, uh, practice it, practice it, practice it, practice it with your dog, practice it in your <laughs> rear view mirror while you're driving, practice it while you're walking in the woods to get grounded. <laughs> Practice, practice, practice. Right. right. You know, another huge issue that older adults have is the assumption or misassumption that they can't do technology. They don't know technology or even to the extreme, they're going to refuse to learn it. Um, we have listeners who are listening to this podcast online on their phone. Uh, so obviously they can, but how can they prove their technology skills to a potential employer to, you know, kind of defeat that ageism look of like, okay, you're over 60, you probably know nothing about computers. How does one overcome that knowing it probably exists? Some of the job seekers come to the Zoom room for the first time and say, well, I've never used this. How do you use it? So we go we'll briefly go over some of the icons and how you use the Zoom room. And I said, this is one of your job search tools. So that's the beginning of it, right? Um, and the phone, the handheld phone, there's so much on here that you can do. We can send a rocket to the moon, apparently, with that technology. Mm -hmm. um, but embrace it. Embrace it. Um, one uh, colleague of mine invited people to sit with their grandchildren or sit with their nieces and nephews and, and start learning some of, some of it. Another technique is to... Um, take courses online, get proficient in, in the whole office suite, get proficient in Excel, get proficient in Google Docs, um, and you take courses where you can say certified in. Uh, one resume writer suggested having even a technical skills section on their resume if, if it's applicable for the job. One recent job seeker was interviewed by a small company and the and the owner interviewed her and said i really need you to um i need your procurement skills you were fabulous for 30 years at this big company i'm a smaller company but i really need those skills i also need you to know excel and she said i i can learn it but i just don't know it at the moment but i can learn it so he rearranged the job description so that another person did the excel part of it because that person loved it and she was doing the procurement part how do you order make sure you order the bottles for the product and make sure the caps come too because that's what happened right <laughs> so um so yes yeah, so sometimes but embrace it embrace it embrace it um and like i said you can add a technical skill section to your resume if that's what the job that would, would for most of your jobs to show that um, Coursera has a lot of um, free courses. LinkedIn has free courses. You can find a lot of organizations that offer free courses in technical skills and, and learn it and practice it. Start Zooming with friends. Start um, Because most of the time, your one of your interviews will be with Microsoft Teams or with Zoom. Right. So learn this technology. It is one of your tools. So many assume that they're going to have their grandparents' retirement, leave the work world to enjoy whatever life brings. However, the media is telling us that baby boomers are not ready to retire, whether it's uh, for personal satisfaction or um, now financial need. How do you describe your clients? Are they looking at full-time employment, part-time? Are, are they staying in their previous career field or moving into something new? I mean, we kind of touched upon that, but we didn't really deep, you know, dive deep into that what are they looking for? Right. Well, that goes back to the original part of the pod podcast when we were talking about self-assessment and how do you really look at what you might want to do in this next age and stage and chapter. I have one former job seeker who was on Wall Street, had been in finance, managing some of Harvard's endowment money, and um and now he's moved from ambition to mission. So he is a part-time controller um, and works for a, a nonprofit organizations. The idea meaning that sometimes it's part-time, sometimes it's full-time, it, it just depends. And it's not like when maybe when you're starting out in your 20s and 30s and thinking, if I do this now full-time, I can grow to this, I can grow to that. A lot of people are trying different things now. It's very common, very common. So if you want to be a barista at a Starbucks, go for it. Um, it, it. There's no shame in work. 
no matter what it is. So try it. See if that's what you like. See if um, the hospitality industry piques your interest rather than maybe the the accounting work you did. I don't know. Try a different industry. Try lots of different things. It's and as I said before, it's it's not the same now. A lot of people want to keep working. They just want to work, be relevant. They want to. It's, some of it is for financial needs. Most of it, um, most of the time, it is financial need. Uh, it's not poverty necessarily, but it's it's just financial need. They wanted to continue building their nest egg. Um, whatever that means. <laughs> um, and then, in, you know, we've got inflation, we've got reality, right? Life, life is very expensive. And yeah. it continues to be correct. Right. I agree. So but, but in general, boomers are not done yet. Boomers want to keep booming. <laughs> they want to keep working. We we do We're that's you and I are still out here doing our, our exciting bits and pieces of our, of our, our work world. Um, Sometimes, so <laughs> yeah, he's still he's still working full time. <laughs> um, it, you know, sometimes um, the someone's transition is smooth. It's a planned transition. They retire from a company knowing they want to go and do something else and sort of prepare themselves to get into it. But oftentimes, and we've seen that just recently with the pandemic, suddenly our whole world is in upheaval. They've either lost their job as we so many did in the recession in the early 2000s, or their hours have been dramatically cut, or uh, they may be doing one job and the, suddenly their employer says they need to do two or three jobs, cobble everything together. <clears throat> Are you? Do you have some specific tips on how to get someone on the right path just to get past the critical part of losing a position? sort of the angst part of having to move on into something new that makes yeah sense. yeah I, we we do touch on that especially in the first session uh with the self-assessment there's a huge piece of grief here um losing your job is one of the top five stressors in your life especially if you have dedicated your career to a company uh to your work um you find yourself suddenly the rug has been pulled out from underneath you. Uh, I have one job seeker who built a division. It's one of the top um, revenue producers for the company. And all of a sudden they decided they want to go in a different direction. So the division is now under the management of somebody else, but he's still part of that team. So how do you, how do you sort of, um, um, lick your wounds if you want to say that mm -hmm. or how do you kind of going through the grief stages right you do have to go through the grief stages and don't ignore it you can try to suppress it but don't ignore it it's 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 painful it's sad it's really sad and forgiveness is important uh it doesn't mean that you uh, that you uh, condone what was what happened to you um and there can be some anger uh, deal with it and, and maybe take some temporary time to work with a, a counselor who can help you, a grief counselor. Uh, it's It can be like losing a spouse. It can be, it can really be a huge traumatic um, issue. So deal with that and don't, don't ignore it because that is a painful thing. And at, when you're ready, uh, start the adventure and really start the assessment and really um, take a, a look right. at what, what is, why has life given you this opportunity mm -hmm. that you had this whole, how do you let go of the cherished outcome that you once had? Right. <clears throat> and right. and I think one of the things that we always used to talk about with our clients is that you're not in this boat alone. Other people are going through the right. same steps and take advantage of holding each other's hand and commiserating together and then move on. Yeah. I had a very emotional first timer um, come to this meeting a few weeks ago and he just said at the end of the session he just said oh my god I didn't know that this was so wonderful he said I I felt so alone this is mm -hmm. so helpful I, so it, it's really great to have a networking group that you can go to right during during the recession in the early 2000s 
um, we heard about a, an individual who was laid off from his job, and he was at a very high executive level in a large company here in town. He was so embarrassed, he hid in his house. He -hmm. wouldn't even go out and get his mail until it was dark so his neighbors didn't see Mm -hmm. him home. They couldn't Mm -hmm. figure out what was going on. Suddenly, one of his neighbors figured out what had happened, that he was home, went over and talked to him, helped him network, and he got another job literally immediately. And Mm -hmm. here he had wasted a whole year of hiding from everyone. And what Mm -hmm. a shame that is. Mm. I highly recommend speak. That just reminds me of a man called Otto with Tom Hanks. It's yeah. a new movie that's yeah. out. It was up for an Academy Award. It really is a very good movie about um, about pain and grief. Mm-hmm. Right. Good. Good. A really good segue into that. Right. And I also recommend people look at the Intern with Robert De Niro. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> we all loved it. We loved it when it came out. And I invite people to stop and look at it again, just at this age and stage Mm -hmm. and and where you are, right? Right, Yeah. right. Yeah. Well, we always ask our guests if they have any last words of wisdom, not that you haven't given a ton already, uh, but maybe that that final one as we leave this episode, do you have any suggestions or advice for our listeners? I do. And Catherine Graham from the Washington Post uh, has a fabulous uh, saying that I always have as a byline on my email, to love what you do and feel that it matters, how could anything be more fun? So I just really invite people to really look at this age and stage as a new chapter, maybe an encore career, maybe an, an opportunity just to find something new in your life. That's wonderful. Deborah, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been phenomenal, and it's a great example how um, we can help our local Central Ohioans in their job search based on on what you've done in in, uh, Massachusetts. So listeners, thank you for joining us, and don't forget to check our show notes for contact information and resources on our website, which is www.lookingforwardourway.com. We are looking forward to hearing from you, your feedback on this and any of our podcast episodes.